So greetings, everyone. I'm Ariella Robison. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Domain Tools, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Mapping Connected Infrastructure with Threat Connect and Domain Tools. Our speakers today will be Kyle Emke, who's the Threat Intelligence Researcher at Threat Connect, and Mark Kendrick, who's Director of Product Integrations here at Domain Tools. Uh, just a few quick housekeeping items. So all attendees are in listen-only mode, but please do feel free to ask questions at any time during the webinar. Simply type your question into the questions panel and we'll do our very best to answer them at the end of the session. Uh, people always ask, so yes, we are making a recording of this webinar and we'll make the slides available to you as well on request. If you happen to be on Twitter, you can follow along at the hashtag DTWebinar and feel free to join the conversation with your own tweets. We offer CPE credit with ISC squared. Uh, that's available to all attendees, so follow up with us after the webinar if you're interested in that. Uh, so a bit more about our guest speaker, uh, Kyle Emke. So he has eight years of experience as a cyber intelligence analyst, previously in the intelligence community and within the healthcare sector. He's followed a wide range of cyber threats, ranging from the Middle East and extremists to more recently, those specifically affecting the healthcare, healthcare and pharmaceutical sector. He is also actively involved with ThreatConnect's research into Russian election activity and target efforts against Bellingcat, WADA, and others. And a bit more about Mark. So uh, Mark has spent over eight years at Domain Tools, helping major brand holders, cybersecurity companies, large internet organizations, and leading incident responders investigate online threats with DNS and who is data. He's held engineering and product leadership roles here and led business development, partner integration activities, as well as pioneering sales relationships with major public and private organizations. And these days he leads our partnership discussions with leading cybersecurity companies such as ThreatConnect uh, to build integrated solutions. So without further ado, take it away, Mark. Very good, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to share with all of you this uh, incredible integration that we have between uh, not only our products, but also our companies. We're very excited to, to share that with you. I'm gonna go ahead and dive right in here. I know there's some folks on the call, perhaps, that are maybe new to Domain Tools. So we'll give you a very quick introduction about who we are. Uh, you may also be familiar with Domain Tools, but perhaps you're just now considering some of our enterprise offerings. And this will be, I hope, a great introduction to that. So Domain Tools helps security analysts turn threat data into threat intelligence. We exist at that conversion process. There's a number of different ways that we do that. You're going to see a few of them today. As you might imagine, I could wax poetic for quite some time about how that actually works, but we prefer to use the words of our customers to articulate how they use domain tools. This list of, um, of bullets that you see here were actually shared by our customers. Um, one of our customers said that they're using domain tools to gain more facts about an ongoing attack and that that's helping them do that much more quickly. They're actually using it to determine if an attack is targeted or non-targeted. They are finding patterns uh, because that helps them pinpoint adversaries and campaigns, uh, usually with a higher degree of confidence than through other mechanisms. You'll see some of that at play today. They're also locating additional indicators, including a command and control infrastructure, um, various other domains, IPs, emails that help them understand an ongoing attack. And they're also tracking additional indicators, which could be new domain registrations, new things pointed at known bad infrastructure. And you're also going to see some of that at play here today. Really, um, what we're talking about in this activity of mapping connected infrastructure, that's the activity that often you see people use when they're employing domain tools. Our data plays a role both in the detection and in the prevention phase as we do work to map that connected infrastructure. It also plays a critical role in the investigate portion. The proverbial uh, iceberg analogy we think applies quite well. The investigative activity is usually about uncovering the things that you cannot readily see. And so we're going to see today, um, especially the way that that plays here, but we're also gonna give you a brief idea uh, toward the very end of this, how mapping connected infrastructure can help you with those other components. So with that, over to Kyle. Thanks, Mark, and uh, good morning or afternoon, folks. Um, in case you haven't heard about Threat Connect before, 
our platform gives organizations the ability to aggregate, analyze, and act on intelligence from all of their internal and external sources. Uh, for example, when indicators are added to the platform from a external intelligence feed or an internal SIM, uh, Threat Connect automatically associates them to identified threats as well as any other activity, groups, or sources that your organization uh, has access to. Threat Connect uh, also then provides abilities to analyze or act on this intelligence by further investigating the identified indicator or deploying it to your organization's defensive efforts. Uh, Threat Connect also gives organizations the ability to send indicators that they've identified from other sources or defensive tools back to their defensive capabilities to further defend their assets. So just by way of background, oops, sorry. Just by way of background, um, I am with the uh, Threat Connect research team where we use the Threat Connect platform to investigate threats, campaigns, and incidents. Uh, we also use the platform to develop research or analytic methodologies and identify intelligence on nation state and criminal threats that ultimately constitutes our TC identify intelligence source. Um, today, I'm going to give an overview of how we use the Threat Connect platform along with domain tools, integrations, and capabilities to proactively build out intelligence on possible fancy bear activity targeting anti-doping and Olympic related organizations. Um, I'll start off today by going over Fancy Bear and some of their activity from 2016. So this is our Fancy Bear threat entry in the Threat Connect Intelligence Source. Um, this hopefully gives you an idea of the type of information and context we can capture in the Threat Connect platform on a given campaign, threat, incident, or even atomic level indicators. Uh, we have a description on the left that summarizes intelligence on Fancy Bear from a variety of OSINT sources, as well as our own research efforts. Um, while not shown in this image, we also have attributes detailing uh, threats, the uh, threats tactics, capabilities such as their malware used, uh, sources, assessed motivations, aliases, and associations. Um, on the right there, you can see some of the tags that we have on this threat. And we use those tags to quickly capture general information on a threat so that we can quickly navigate to the threat later via queries. And here is um, where we also capture information like what industries a threat has targeted. This is really invaluable because it um, later allows us and our consumers to identify threats or relevant activity based off of the sector in which they operate. So one of the incidents that we've associated to Fancy Bear is this 2016 activity targeting the World Anti-Doping Agency, Anti-Doping Agency, excuse me, or WADA, uh, as well as the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Shortly after Russia was banned from the 2016 Summer Olympic Games, Fancy Bear targeted WADA and or individuals associated with them. Um, as part of this operation, they used spoof domains that resembled WADA's own legitimate domains. Um, this was followed shortly, uh, excuse me, this was followed uh, shortly by the emergence of uh, the Fancy Bears hack team Faketivist. Uh, and we use that term to describe a fake persona uh, that leaks documents as part of an influence operation. And uh, they leaked documents um, that it purported to have stolen from WADA and tried to cast a negative light on non-Russian athletes. Now, fast forward a year and a half and Russia was banned from the 2018 Winter Olympic Games. Now, this kind of sets the scene for the intelligence that we will discuss later. Uh, generally, I'm sure at this point, um, a lot of people are tired of us talking about Fancy Bear all the time, uh, but unfortunately they haven't gone away, so we'll just keep talking about them until they do. Um, and just to summarize some of their other activity, Fancy Bear has been associated with attacks on the Clinton campaign, the Democratic National Committee, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, and uh, like I mentioned before, WADA and the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Many of their attacks used spear phishing messages that spoofed email security services like Google 
and contained short URLs that redirected the target to a credential harvesting page. Now, of note, several of Fancy Bear operations here also included public facing mouthpieces that were used to leak stolen information, such as Guccifer 2.0, DC Leaks, and the aforementioned Fancy Bear's hack team. Of note, um, in many of these operations, uh, we see Fancy Bear domains that use these small or boutique name servers that are likely indicative of the hosting service they went through to procure the domain and uh, procure their infrastructure. Many of these name servers host less than 2,500 domains, which is actually really small when you compare it to something like a GoDaddy name server that might host uh, hundreds of thousands or even millions of domains. Um, there on the slide, you can see some of these name servers that uh, we've identified. Additionally, many of their domains were hosted on dedicated servers where only one domain is hosted at a given IP. Oftentimes, their domains were registered using one-on-one -on -one email domains or other non-Gmail or Yahoo uh, email domains like centrum.cz or tutanota.com. So identifying these consistent registration and hosting tactics is really important because we can, we can exploit them to proactively identify their potential infrastructure. And in some cases, possibly before they can actually even use it in operations. So to exploit these tactics, uh, we use Domain Tools Iris to review newly registered domains that use one of those name servers previously mentioned. Um, we then take those domains and identify which ones are hosted on dedicated infrastructure. So here's an example of that IRIS query. Just to the right of the menu, you can see that we're searching for domains that use any one of the small or boutique name servers that we've seen Fancy Bear domains use. We further specify this query by only looking for domains that have been created since the last iteration of this research. Um, and also we um, only look for domains that weren't registered using a yahoo.com or gmail.com email address. Iris provides us the capability to specify all of those parameters in our query. And this ultimately helps us keep the number of results manageable. And then we then take those domains and we review them to identify those that are hosted on dedicated servers. Now, in some of our late 2017 and early 2018 iterations of this research, um, we had some really interesting domains returned. Uh, notably, we've seen domains spoofing the US Anti-Doping Agency, USADA, uh, and the UK Anti-Doping, UKAD. Um, these were uh, uh, both hosted on dedicated servers. Now, given that Russia was banned in December from the 2018 Olympic Games and their history of retaliating against WADA, these domains seem significant and merit additional research. Uh, there was also a third domain, networksolutions.pw, that we identified that wasn't immediately notable beyond its use of a dedicated server, um, but we'll get into that domain a little bit later. Um, we're going to take a look at all of these domains using Threat Connect and domain tools to build out our intelligence on this possible activity. So let's start by taking a look at that USADA spoofing domain, webmail-usada.org. Unfortunately, this domain was registered using privacy protection, so a registrant email address isn't um, available in the Whois record for us to pivot off of. Um, sometimes though, when privacy protection is enabled, you can still get the registrant's email address by taking a look at the start of authority records or SOA records for a given domain. So here in our investigation links, we can quickly query external resources for the given domain. In this case, we're going to take a look at Hurricane Electric in hopes that we've got an SOA record. 
And fortunately enough, we do have an email address in the SOA record. Here we see a Jerry Fisk at tuta.io registrant. This is great as it identifies another indicator that we might be able to use. Unfortunately, um, here within this tool, we don't have a good option for identifying other domains that might have this email address in their SOA records. Um, so at this point, I'm going to pass it back over to Mark. Mark, how might you go about investigating this USADA spoofed domain in IRIS? Certainly. So the first thing that I would do um, is I would simply uh, go to IRIS and I would enter the domain name in the search box and then see what information IRIS is able to surface. Now that, as you said, being able to pull the SOA record on a single domain during an investigation, very helpful. I know a number of people who are comfortable doing that at the command line, one off and maybe a, a quick dig lookup or using a handy tool uh, like what Hurricane Electric provides there to be able to view that interaction. Actively. Uh, the challenge, of course, as you said, is that there's not really anything else you can do with it from there. The great thing that we're doing here at Domain Tools is we're basically performing that same kind of DNS lookup about once a day for every domain, pretty much every domain on the internet, certainly every domain that we know of. And what that does is it lets us pull that data in, place it adjacent to the identity data and the web crawl data, the SSL cert data, and a bunch of other things we're providing and make it all available inside of IRIS. So the first thing that's handy, of course, is simply having the adjacency of that other data together with that SOA record, but clearly we can do more. So in this case here, there's a lot of things going on within IRIS. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over into the visualization because that's a good way to get a feel for the various indicators that are attached with this. We can see some of those privacy protection email addresses that Kyle mentioned a moment ago, but notice also there is that um, Jerry Fisk at tuta.io email. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to right click on that. And when we do, it is going to bring up this context menu. Now, I, you notice there that I, I said something special. I said, right click. Now that might not be something that you're very familiar with. So I have a public service announcement brought to you by the Domain Tools account management and customer success teams. This my friends is a right click button. You will find it somewhat unsurprisingly on the right hand side of your mouse. It's very important to know how to operate the right click button when you're inside of Iris because it gives you this incredible little menu here and on pretty much almost everything else inside of Iris. Now, if you're on a Mac, um, well, uh, it's complicated. I'll leave you for that to figure out on your own. I can say that it's worth figuring it out and I'll show you why. Back into this investigation here, notice that it says two domains share that value. I only know of one so far, so already I have discovered something interesting. There is a useful thread for me to pull on here. I can then locate the expand search option within the filters menu, click on that, and now you'll see that I have an additional domain name added into this visualization, this usada.eu domain name. So Kyle, does that sound like that's something that might be useful in your investigation? I would say so, yeah. I mean, so you know, now that we see that the individuals behind this effort also registered another USADA spoofing domain, that suggests that they have a concerted effort to leverage USADA's likeness in an operation. So let's take a look at another domain that spoofs the UK Anti-Doping Association. Um, here in the ThreatConnect platform, we have a couple of different integrations with domain tools. So let's see how we might be able to leverage those to trace out and identify additional intelligence related to this login-ukad.org.uk domain. Here in our Who Is tab for domain entry, we can get the Who Is record for the given domain. Now, here we see that the domain was registered using the name Zender Inc. We also see a Vapodinkatu57, I probably butchered that, um, as a string in the registrant's address. These strings seem fairly unique, so we're going to create a track to monitor them. 
uh, tracks allow us to run a domain tools reverse who is against supplied strings and get alerted to any new domains that are registered with those strings. So here we create a track that is searching for any who is record containing both the Zender Inc. and Vapudin Katu 57 strings. Then we'll hit test. And now we see that the track is valid and has three results. So, you know, that's a good indicator. It means that we've potentially found two other domains that are associated to this activity. Um, so let's save, uh, let's click save and take a look at those results. So here in the track itself, we see a description for the track. Um, we also have the option to be alerted anytime a new domain is registered with those strings in the who is information. And this is really, really powerful because this can be used to proactively identify any domains, any new domains uh, that are associated with activity that you might have experienced. Now, to review the domains, we click on the results tab. And here we can see the other two domains that were registered using the same who is information. Again, notably, we see two other domains that also spoof UK anti-doping um, again, suggesting a concerted effort to leverage their likeness in operations. Now, before I get into the last example, I want to toss it over to Mark to give an overview of our other integration with Domain Tools, the Domain Tools Spaces app. Certainly, Kyle, I'd be glad to. So as Kyle showed you, that track feature is incredibly powerful for enumerating other domain names that are connected with a similar identity or attributes within the Whois record, and also, importantly, keeping track of that over time. That was actually one of the first integrations that Domain Tools did with any company, and it has remained um, a key value driver for a lot of our mutual customers. Clearly Clearly, um, that's effective. We wanted to then extend some of that within the investigative context and the spaces architecture within Threat Connect provided an excellent opportunity for us to do that. There are some key capabilities that you can do with the Domain Tools Spaces app. Um, you'll be able to, when you surface various attributes, you'll actually be able to store those as indicators in Threat Connect. That's really the key value that Threat Connect brings to an investigation like this, is it provides not only that context, but also that persistence. So you don't lose track of the uh, work that you've done. You can also pivot from various domain attributes um, to lists of related domain names, not just by attributes in the uh, who is record, but also attributes uh, related to the infrastructure that the domain is hosted on. And you'll see a little bit of that into here. And then also you can reveal historical identities and even previous web hosting profiles all directly within the Spaces app by leveraging our who is history and our hosting history capabilities. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to Kyle to show us how that might work. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so with that in mind, we're going to take a look at the generic domain that I alluded to earlier, networksolutions.pw. Um, based on our domain tools, who is results, we can see that the domain was registered using the email address watteson at tuta.io. Um, we, could, we could create a track for this email address, but instead we're going to show how we can pivot from this email address using the domain tool spaces app. So here in the Spaces tab, we can see the Domain Tools Spaces app. If we scroll down, we see the Watteson at tuta.io email address in the uh, contact information. The plus sign to the right allows us to add that email address in as an indicator, while the arrow allows us to pivot off of that email address and identify other domains registered using that same email address. So when we do so, we see that this email address was also used to register the domain wada-adams.org. 
That domain spoofs the World Anti-Doping Agency and their Anti-Doping Administration and Management System, or ADAMS. In conjunction with the previously mentioned domain spoofing other anti-doping organization, this domain also stands out. Uh, if our organization is related to the anti-doping sector or the Olympics or is otherwise concerned about Fancy Bear, we want to be on the lookout for this infrastructure. Now, to summarize, it's important to note that while these domains have consistencies to previously identified Fancy Bear infrastructure, it's not definitive and not enough to attribute the domains to them. Further, we don't have an indication that these domains have actually been used in operations. But I'd argue that if known bad is the only thing that you're concerned with, then you're really missing out on an opportunity to be proactive and employ threat intelligence analysis to its greatest extent. Um, this activity that spoofed anti-doping uh, domains is also reminiscent of the 2016 activity that targeted WADA and the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Notably as well, the uh, Fancy Bears hack team persona resurfaced on January 10th in the middle of these domains being registered, and they claimed to have stolen IOC emails or uh, International Olympic Committee emails. It's also worth pointing out as well that Trend Micro recently released a report on PondStorm, aka Fancy Bear, um, and their activity targeting international athletic and Olympic organizations. So I would advocate for checking out that report if this has been of interest to you. Um, you may have also noticed earlier that both the USADA and UKD domains that we initially discussed are hosted on the same CIDR block. That provides another potential investigation thread that we can pull on. So Mark, as an organization that might be concerned about activity from that range or any of the aforementioned indicators, how would you leverage domain tools to identify other associations to Fancy Bear and protect their network? Certainly, yes, I'd be glad to uh, show you how that might work. You know, really, um, if we look at kind of the high level of what it is that um, Kyle has has done here in his research, he has gone through and he's mapped the connected infrastructure of this actor group, and it's helped give him a far better understanding of um, the indicators that are included in their arsenal, if you will, um, and also to surface new activity and evidence of an ongoing campaign. Oftentimes, um, folks sometimes ask us, well, that's that's great, um, but I have a network that I need to defend. I have some users that like clicking on links they shouldn't, and I want to try and protect them. How do these things actually help me uh, in those daily activities? And the reality is that that activity of mapping connected infrastructure can be very effective in that role. So really, when I look at these fancy investigative techniques that uh, Kyle has employed here. These are really things that I could employ every day if I was a network defender. If I was looking to level up the capabilities perhaps of my team, maybe if I wanted to bring in uh, the concept of a, of a threat hunting activity within my organization, maybe I was still um, working to build up an entire team to that, but I still wanted some of those capabilities here. These same things could apply. And you know, I, I have to admit that the whole bow tie and monocle on the bear is really working out for me. So I just had to find another reason to work that in here. But let's go through some of these bullets and I'll, I'll show you exactly that. And, and that cider block um, that Kyle mentioned provides a good example. You know, when you're looking at a, a domain name that comes in um, to your network, um, a lot of folks tend to, to focus on the IP address. And that's certainly good looking at maybe the IP location of where it's at. Uh, that that again, that wonderful right-click functionality inside of Iris can help you quickly identify these smaller uh, boutique hosting, um, these indications of um, dedicated servers. And so pivoting on IP addresses, uh, instead of just looking at the IP address and its location, can really help level up your capability. If we take a look um, inside of Iris here, again, a lot going on, just walk you through this very briefly. Um, I took that uh, CIDR range that 
Kyle provided us earlier. This could also apply um, maybe just to, uh, maybe over the course of a few days, I've seen um, a links in phishing emails and I'm looking at the IPs and I'm like, you know, I, I think I've seen this before. Oh, wait a minute. I go into Threat Connect. I look at the um, information I've persisted in there and I discover, ah, uh, yeah, you know what? This is within the same cider block, the same net block. And so I wonder if maybe I should widen my gaze a little bit and, and look a little more broadly within here. And indeed, that's what I'm doing here. Uh, this view where I have the pivot engine inside of Iris on one side, and then a passive DNS view on the other side, really helps us see the power of both of these data sets together. Um, on the one side in the pivot engine, you're seeing the result of our active DNS, um, the result, as I mentioned earlier, with the SOA record of enumerating domains on the internet, figuring out where they're pointing, keeping that data current. Um, that's the list of domains you see here. And then on the other side, inside of PDNS, you see our integration with a number of leading providers of passive DNS data, showing me, uh, looks like an additional set of domains, um, and also some host names, and of course the usual uh, powerful things you get when looking at a passive DNS data set. You get to see when they were first seen, um, an idea of how busy they were. And again, very useful um, data set um, to look at the investigation together. So already we've taken one of those investigative techniques and we've leveled up our ability to understand the traffic related to an IP and the other things that are connected to it. Now, when I look over the process that um, Kyle went through here, there was a number of uh, indications of name servers, as he mentioned, uh, boutique name servers that seem to apply to this uh, particular actor group. You may surface some of the same things. When you're researching a phishing email, you may find that uh, the actors which have chosen to target your organization have found their preferred source of web hosting that maybe gives them the right level of anonymity or whatever it is that is their selection criteria. And so as you begin to recognize that pattern, you can actually begin watching for that, which helps shift you more into a proactive stance. Same thing might apply with registrant names. Now, to give you an idea of how that might work, certainly, um, on the right-hand side, we have um, a screenshot that I took actually for um, some domains. I got an email over the weekend from Threat Connect uh, as I was preparing for this last week. Um, some of the tracks that I had set up and some of the attributes that Kyle and I were speaking about as we prepared this content, um, my weekend was being interrupted with Fancy Bear and it was sending in notifications. So clearly uh, those tracks, which are powered by the domain tools uh, register and alert capability can be very effective. On the other side here, you see um, in this case, I just used our name server monitor and I was looking specifically at this bitcoin-dns.hosting name server. I did this query actually just a, a few hours ago. So these are domains that were recently stood up or recently pointed to those name servers. In this case here, I made the query directly to our API, but that could also have come to me in email. Either way, if I've identified an attribute of an actor group that seems to be recurring, this provides me an opportunity to perhaps create my own custom block list, highly targeted, precisely targeted at the um, activities that relate to um, the things that I am researching, uh, create that custom blacklist and wire that into the various tools that I, I have available. Some of our integrations help facilitate that, but of course we have an API and you can always do that as well. And then there's another um, element that um, we noticed as we were going through this, and we were hunting for domains with specific patterns in the registrant emails. Um, Kyle and his research had identified a set of registrant email domains, um, excluding the, the Gmails and Hotmails of the world um, that were indicative of um, the activities that he had seen in here and that consistency. That, of course, um, could be applied, as I mentioned before, as an ongoing um, element that we are perhaps searching for, but it also provides us the ability to go hunting with precision. Now, to give you an idea of how that might work, let me overwhelm you a little bit here with this slide. This is a view into Splunk, 
And the idea, some of you may not be familiar with Splunk. Um, if, if some of you are familiar with Splunk and you are horrified by my inability to write an efficient query inside of Splunk, my sincere apologies. Please email me and let me know how I can approve it. But what you're looking at um, is, again, we're talking about how mapping um, connected infrastructure helps us level up our, our security capabilities, how an investigation that is conducted in Threat Connect inside of Domain Tools Iris, how we can take the things we've learned in there and actually apply that to the challenge of network defense and even um, threat hunting. In this case, again, if you're not familiar with Splunk, really just focus on that last line in the search box there where it says a search registrant email domain equal to, and in this case, I chose a, a quite a popular uh, free email uh, provider in China, qq.com. Um, because I, I had some data that I knew that it would find inside of Splunk. But essentially what I'm doing here, <clears throat> pardon me, is that I am looking for evidence on my network of activity related to that same registry and email domain. I have joined together my web proxy logs together with um, the domain tools, domain profile, and risk score data that is um, coming in on a regular basis, merge that in, and now I'm actually searching by the attributes of the Whois record, in this case for the qq.com. Imagine that you didn't know that there was some specific attributes attributes you should care about until after maybe some research happened, after an investigation happened, and now you wanted to actually find out if there was evidence of that in the past <clears throat> before you knew to look for it. This provides a way to do that. So again, hopefully that helped you see how this is um, certainly not only an interesting view uh, into the ongoing um, efforts of, of whomever it is that's behind Fancy Bear, uh, but also ways that you can leverage both uh, Threat Connect um, and domain tools together to help map connected infrastructure, to become aware of new identities, uh, hosting infrastructure, and then take those same capabilities and actually apply them uh, locally to the defense of your own network and the protection of your users. So with that, um, Ariella, do we have any questions? Yeah, we sure do. Um, so one that came in uh, during the course of the talk was, um, about if you are searching for the SOA and Hurricane Electric, uh, do you need to have account credentials? So that's pretty pretty specific, but I want to, and I should have probably answered asked that as it came up, but no, that's no problem. problem. Go ahead, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, so um, as far as I'm aware, you do not need an account um, to conduct searches in Hurricane Electric and get that SOA information. Okay, great. Um, let's see, and then someone wanted to know about uh, IPv6 and how the migration to that um, is going to potentially help reduce attacks or what that's going to do, IPv6. IPv6. Kyle, do you have any insights on that? Um, unfortunately, I don't. Um, I might defer to you, Mark, if you had any. Um, sure. Yeah. I think really what we're what we're looking for is we're looking to see um, IPv6 used as part of the attacks, and uh, certainly as part of our web crawl, we are. Um, uh, I'm sorry, as part of our DNS crawl, we are resolving uh, domains of all types, uh, starting to look at bringing in quad A records, folding that into our products. Um, but we are actually still waiting to see that um, leveraged in some sort of, a, of an actual attack context, because then that mm -hmm. will help us develop tools that specifically defend against that. I think one thing that would be valuable if folks are seeing some attacks that are beginning to use um, IPv6, uh, you're seeing some uh, additional data or maybe some unique data in Quad A records than what you're seeing elsewise. Um, be sure to reach out, let us know, um, tell us uh, what it is that we should be, be looking for and we can fold that into our, um, not only our integration plans but also our overall product roadmap to ensure that we're developing um, capabilities that specifically address that. Great, thank you. Uh, and then we wanted to know if you've seen activity targeting any or other organizations related to the Olympics. Right. Topical. Sure, yeah. So I can I can handle that one. Um, I also had a fancy bear late in weekend. Um, so there are a couple mm -hmm. of other organizations that um, we've seen spoofed recently as well that we didn't have a chance to include in the presentation. 
Um, one is the Olympic Council of Asia, um, and the other one that we've identified more recently, um, in fact, uh, just uh, this weekend and yesterday, is the uh, Berlinger Group. Um, now, that one might not sound familiar, but they are closely related to anti-doping organizations. Um, the Berlinger mm -hmm. Group produces the uh, tamper-evident urine testing kits that are used to test Olympic athletes and ensure that their samples haven't been altered. Um, if you've seen it, um, those kits uh, were actually featured prominently in the uh, Icar I'm sorry, the Icarus documentary on Netflix. Um, and you know, again, we haven't seen those domains actually used in operations, um, but they have those same fancy bear consistencies that uh, the um, Olympic and anti-doping agencies should be on the lookout for. Um, so if you're interested, um, I would advocate for checking out our blog and our uh, Twitter feed as well for some more information on those domains. Interesting. Um, good. And then somebody was wondering just, you know, when you would use IRIS versus Threat Connect because we showed both today. Certainly. I'd be glad to answer that one. Um, I would say that um, the, the difference really between um, choosing one or the other um, really comes down to kind of where you're at within the phase of your investigation. Um, if you're kind of just starting out, maybe getting uh, your, your bearings around something, a great place to start, of course, with that is inside of Threat Connect. and provides a place for you to begin structuring it, um, checking and correlating with other intelligence sources, and really putting a, sort of a framework and building a context there. And then combined with the Spaces app, getting a nice quick view as to whether there could be uh, some useful threads to pull uh, in that investigation, and again, persisting that. Uh, then from there, if you are finding um, fancy things, if you are beginning to um, maybe uh, even hit some dead ends perhaps and you want to see if there's some other threads to pull, um, then that would be a great time to then switch on over uh, into Iris and begin, mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, right clicking on everything because mm -hmm. you'll be able to begin pulling up those little boxes that helps you help you quickly see where the counts are at as you begin to um, uh, surface places with uh, smaller numbers of counts, um, then those could be indicative of, again, direct actor controlled infrastructure or identities. Pivot on those, merge in some PDNS data, maybe explore some of the screenshot data, um, you know, go through the visualization components inside of Iris. And then when you're done, you can export that as a CSV and bring that back into Threat Connect to persist in the context of the investigation that you began there. Great. And then uh, somebody wanted to know, uh, what's the easiest way to determine if a domain is on dedicated infrastructure? That is a good question, Kyle. You want to uh, take a first, uh, <laughs> first uh, effort at that one? Sure, yeah. So um, one of the things that I usually do to check whether or not it's hosted on dedicated infrastructure is take a look at the domain profile in domain tools um, for the given domain. Uh, additionally, something else that I'll always take a look at is the passive DNS information for that IP um, and the uh, and the domain itself, really. Um, and that can give you an idea of the extent to which it might be hosted on a uh, dedicated infrastructure. Absolutely, I think that's a I think that's a great um, technique there. And just to expand mm -hmm. on on that, um, when um, Kyle is talking about the, the domain profile on that one, he's he's talking about um, those counts again um, that you get um, in in the con in the case of Iris. You'll get that when you right click on uh, in an IP, and it tells you how many additional domains are there. Uh, it, that. Um, IP can be not only where uh, the domain is, is pointed, um, maybe like the dub, dub, dub or, or perhaps the apex portion of the domain, uh, but also applies in the mail servers as well. Uh, I've seen some, some aggregation there and also on the IP address of the name server. So not just the name server name, but the IP address that the name server is on. Um, any, again, any one of those places uh, and quickly right click, bring up that count. If it's a, if it's a lower count, and I, I realize that lower is somewhat of a, of a relative phrase, uh, you'll develop some sensitivities for this as, as you begin investigating. What I hear often is um, certainly, you know, numbers in the tens um, is really a strong indication that they're probably all related. Um, even ones in maybe like the lower hundreds um, might indicate um, at least some commonality there um, and can sometimes combined with other ways uh, refine that down uh, even further. 
Okay, great. And then um, just to piggyback on that one a little bit, it's how often do you do that kind of uh, name server research? I guess that's more uh, about name servers, but how often does that come up? Kyle? Sure, yeah. So the, uh, the name server research that I described earlier that sort of initially clued us into the USADA and UKAD spoof domains, um, I had been doing that um, probably about once every week or so. Um, uh, more recently, it seems that there have been, you know, a lot of these domains with those fancy bear consistencies popping up. So I've been doing it a little bit more regularly, two or three times a week. That's great, Kyle. I think when I um, speak with uh, network defenders and also people using um, IRIS for their investigations, I see uh, increasingly uh, people looking to the name server uh, less because it's a name server and more, as Kyle suggested earlier, indicative of the web hosting infrastructure that an, uh, an actor has chosen. Even if you were to right click on in, inside of Iris and, and come up with a, a fairly large number of domain names that may be difficult to, to parse through effectively, simply using that name server, um, and again, I showed you in Splunk, but there's a number of other ways to do this also, um, using that name server as part of your detection um, can sometimes um, help you surface things that uh, you, you might otherwise miss. Again, that's because of the, um, the hosting profile that is offered by that particular web host. In a number of these cases here, we have ones that are accepting Bitcoin. And of course, that provides the level of anonymity. Um, there's a few others that uh, are maybe preferred because of free trials that they offer. Um, other ways of, of sort of reducing the actor's cost, increasing their anonymity or some mix of the other. And so I'm beginning to see um, that trend happen. I've also seen a few places where um, actors will spin up their own name servers and their own name server infrastructures. Sometimes it, you can tell that you can spot this pretty quickly, um, either with the, uh, the right clicks inside of Iris or um, by having a name server that is actually the same name as the domain name. That to me is usually a strong indication um, that something wicked this way comes because it's pretty unusual for folks to do that um, and could be that they're trying to avoid aggregation and grouping on the name server itself. They've sort of figured out that people are maybe looking at that. But again, um, as I alluded to a moment ago, simply looking at um, other domain names using a name server on the same IP address can often be effective at getting behind that. Great. Well, thanks again to both of you. Uh, I think that's the end of our set of questions. That was great content, great presentation. Uh, so thanks everyone uh, who attended today and do look on both the threatconnect.com website and the domaintools.com website for more information and to find out about future webinars. We do, we do them all the time. So definitely um, take a look at that. And uh, thanks again, Mark and Kyle. And uh, good luck out there. Certainly. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.